is an artist and curator and professor who has a fabulous fabulous home and studio in Pasadena, California. And uh, you can see her working on this first slide that we have up. And then this is some of her work that she has in um, actually behind her on her screen. And Joan, um, as an artist, has exhibited widely and has her artwork in many prestigious public and private collections, including LACMA, the De Young Museum in San Francisco, and the Smithsonian. Um, she also has an upcoming solo exhibition at the Craft in America Gallery about a year from now, mm -hmm. and uh, that's going to be very exciting to see. As far as education, Joan holds an MA uh, Master of Arts from Stanford University. She has a Bachelor of Arts from UCLA. She studied ceramics with Ralph Becerra and others at Otis College of Art and Design, where she actually now runs the ceramics program um, at, the, at Otis. And she's also studied at Japan and the Tokyo University. Uh, and this is kind of where I wanna begin our conversation um, with Joan's education, as well as her family's history, because both are extremely important aspects as, for her as a person moving throughout the world and also in her studio. So Joan, I kind of wanted to start with um, you telling us a little bit about where you come from, who your people are, your family, and did you always want to be an artist? And how did your educational path kind of lead you to ceramics? Because you didn't necessarily start there. No, I, I, I like to think the late bloomers eventually take over the garden because my, my journey in art was circuitous. Um, as you can see, all the photographs up here, these are the colleges I've attended and eventually became a uh, came down to Southern California in Santa Monica to teach at Crossroads School. And then I became the academic dean of the middle school at Crossroads in Santa. And I wanted to uh, make coffee mugs for every middle school faculty member for Christmas. And so I took a ceramics class at Otis. And I, uh, 30 years later, I'm still trying to make those coffee mugs. But I, uh, I do think that much of what I do is has been informed by my time at UCLA as a geography and East Asian studies major at Stanford as an education uh, student and of course at Otis, where I really finally figured out what I really wanted to do and that was ceramics. I, I didn't start this journey until I was 30 years old, so I, I do like to think I was I'm a late bloomer. <laughs> awesome, so you want to tell us a little bit about your family. Sure. Um, my father was a, uh, an architect. He graduated from the USC School of Architecture in 1941, just before Pearl Harbor. And upon, upon graduating, he was drafted into the US uh, Army, where he then joined the um, uh, military intelligence department. And he was uh, paired with a Navajo gentleman or Navajo gentleman and they, they translated from Japanese to English to Navajo. So uh, some of my years, early years were spent on the reservation, the Navajo reservation. I think there was a popular film called The Wind Talkers. And uh, my mother worked at the Huntington Hospital in Pasadena. And this is an example on your left of one of my dad's projects, which is still ex exists. It's right next to Superior Court. And on a good, nice, windy day, uh, when that fountain is, is uh, in its glory, it does uh, tend to splash the windows of City Hall. So at the time, Mayor Yorty, who was not one of our favorite, he was very racist and anti-everybody, uh, everybody, people of color, he was complaining. Uh, and so my dad said, turn it up. Turn it up. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so Joan, you grew up in Pasadena then? Yes, yes, yes. So my family arrived, my uh, grandfather is in the center there, um, Shichitaro Takayama. He was, uh, he was working on the railroad and he, he worked on repairing the transcontinental railroad and then laying the, the track of the big red car. And in 1906, he arrived in Pasadena with the big red car and bought a, Chinese laundry, which he renamed the Meiji laundry at one point, uh, just before World War II, uh, and it closed in 1941 with relocation, 
uh, camps. My, uh, I think we had about 300 employees. There, uh, he was able to get uh, seven families to uh, join the Meiji Laundry, and uh, it was truly a cottage industry. So we've been in Pasadena uh, quite a long time, and it was a major, major um, uh, endeavor to get all of these seven families uh, who own part of Meiji. People would do the handwork at home, and so he truly had a cottage industry with horse and buggy going from house to house, um, picking up laundry that has been that had been cleaned and then delivering it to uh, to customers. Wow. So so well, this will show up later, but we've kind of um, so in in Pasadena, since you have long family roots in Pasadena. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about these slides in terms of being influence, a little bit of influence, kind of a precursor to what we're going to be looking at in some of your work. Sure. Uh, I think that's right across from uh, the Norton Simon, it looks like, but our laundry was right next door to, would be would be located in the uh, around the parking lot of the Norton Simon, just to give you a, a geography lesson. But I worked on the Rose Parade. I worked on the Rose Parade uh, since I was in eighth grade. Uh, I was a paid employee, uh, which is kind of unusual, mostly volunteers, but I had certain skills that I didn't know about. And so they would harness me and I would be held on by a harness front suspended from the ceiling. And I would kind of swing by with uh, onion seeds. I had a bucket of onion seeds around my neck and I would swing by and uh, place onion seeds wherever they were necessary. So that my specialization was onion seeds. Awesome. Is this where you started learning about color too? You know, that is a really interesting thing. Um, I, I think my, I had a lot of lessons in uh, art, but it wasn't formal training. I didn't go to school or anything, but my father was uh, very, very, very artistic. Of course, my mother was extremely artistic, but my dad was the one who could draw anything, do anything. He had good color sense. And at the Rose Parade, with uh, building the Rose Parades, it start, it's a year round job. So I worked in chicken wire and, you know, paper mache and welding. And, you know, I learned a lot of, uh, a lot of skills on the job and also flowers, of course, and plant material. So it's not surprising that I would make great, uh, tea time at Great Aunt Tilly's a Rose Parade float. It's in the Cam Teapot Foundation. Um, and so here, here you can see the spout is on the left-hand side of the Great Aunt Tilly's house. Uh, the roof was made with Cracklin Oat Bran cereal. And I think I used about 30 glazes along with uh, China paint and gold luster. And probably this piece was fired nine, uh, nine to 12 times, I don't know. When, like, so was this really early on when you discovered ceramics and kind mm -hmm. of, not really, not really. Um, my family has been in ceramics since the 15th century in Japan. And so um, I, I think really it was an auspicious destiny for me to work in clay. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it was anything that was encouraged, although my father was um, actively engaged in the ceramic studio with the great Glenn, legendary Glenn, Glenn Lukens, who's attributed to being the first American studio potter. And Glenn and my dad were quite close friends. Uh, and he wrote to my dad throughout uh, World War II. Upon dad returning from Korea, because he went with MacArthur in, in military intelligence over to the occupation of Japan. And then uh, just as they were leaving to go to Korea, dad returned home. And uh, he, he never saw Glenn Lukens again, because by then Glenn Lukens was um, going uh, off to Haiti, where he would spend the rest of his life. Oh, so. Wow. Yeah, so we have a long history with, with ceramics. And here's my family uh, in Japan. As I said, I think I believe that they were in the 15th century from what I can tell, and I have taken a trip to Tokoname. And of course I did go to school in Japan for a year in the uh, UC campus uh, junior year abroad. But in Tokoname is, is one of the ancient kilns of Japan. Uh, and you can even see as you walk down the street, you can see that they use old pots as, as retaining walls. And my family is involved very actively in this red teapot ware. But I, I do think that they're probably from, they were, I, I actually think they were Korean slaves that, uh, slave potters who were captured and brought to Tokoname. I think that's the origin. Because I saw the very same things in Korea. I saw the very same work 
and similar uh, technology in Korea of that same time period. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, <laughs> when I was at ICU, International Christian University in Mitaka, Japan, which is just outside of Tokyo, uh, and you, uh, ICU is the um, campus for the University of California, and it is a Jomon site. It is these Jomon pots. Um, are These are pretty indicative. These look like uh, uh, high, high Jomon or you know middle Jomon uh, work, but again, these coil terracotta pots, uh, a little bit, they have a little bit of mica in them. And uh, what was fortunate for me is that my first uh, quarter at UCLA, I signed up for dating techniques and um, it wasn't the course I thought it was going to be. It was, I, I thought it would improve my social skills, but instead I learned carbon-14, <laughs> dendrochronology, obsidian hydration, which opened the door for me to have, uh, to be able to go and study Jomon pottery. And it would also open the door for me to go to Stanford and work in the geology lab and archaeology lab. So what, so what were these pots used for? Because they're very ornate. They are very ornate, but you know it is very different climatically in Japan. Um, it, you know, one thousand before Christian era, we found a residue of of acorns, and I saw no trace of uh, acorns. So the, their climate change. I mean, the climate had changed. We saw evidence of um, very little rice. I do not think that these people were necessarily rice eaters, but oh. we saw we found acorn residue. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. And were, were these, these were just, they were always just uh, neutral colors, right? They didn't have glazes yeah. or anything. No okay. glazes. These are all, uh, pit, these are all uh, pit fired. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I had to try it for my, for my uh, garden. And I don't have the uh, colon, I, I planted the colon choa, but now I have uh, tomatoes growing out of them. So this was my response to uh, actually food uh, insecurity in Los Angeles. I, I made these in preparation for uh, during the pandemic. And uh, then I thought, well, let's tear out the succulents and let's get in, get some, grow, start growing some food. And so I taught online uh, food insecurity and uh, the students made uh, ceramic uh, vessels and started growing food in them. Remarkable. Oh, relocation camps will be a big deal. Um, this photograph was on the left was taken by my dad uh, before he went overseas to Asia, to the Pacific Theater. He was allowed to go to Gila River to find his family. So my father is relocated, separated from his family, and he didn't know where they were. So he had to find them. And he took this photograph of the barracks uh, from uh, a hilltop. You can see the saguaro cacti. Uh, and he just gives you an idea of the large uh, vastness of the Gila River uh, relocation camp. This, there were two camps, a Gila River one and Gila River two. And he had not yet met my mother, but my mother was in Poston relocation camp. And here she is uh, uh, looking happy. Yeah. And I just want to jump in and say too, I know we're kind of jumping around a lot to get, you, to get everyone some background information. But this is also kind of how conversations go when you're actually in a studio visit, meeting with artists. And so um, it's very kind of appropriate that we're kind of doing it this way. Um, but, but her family history, Joan, has, um, has influenced some artwork that you've made and also other projects where you've been helping people reconnect. I know when I was at Otis, you were also talking about um, that all these uh, like, uh, safety security boxes at banks had, um, had been discovered and you were helping people get yeah. their items back and everything too. So it's like, there's this, this narrative that kind of runs through your work and your history. That's true, that's true. Um, kind of helping people find their histories. Yes, and this is, these are all ceramic and I learned to print on clay. And so, uh, and so this was, uh, I took a lot of, I uh, took relocation photographs um, by Toyomi Take, Ansel Adams and uh, Dorothy Lang and the War Relocation Authorities and then screen them, screen printed them onto clay and then fired them. I had to create the, the glaze chemistry for it to make it work. And then uh, here is a, a tribute to um, 
all of my family members uh, who were relocated. And so along the perimeter outside of the barbed wire are their names. Mm -hmm. And then on the sides are, um, I think this is President Ford's letter to all Japanese Americans, the American promise that relocation will never happen again. It was just a promise though. It's not where, a law. Did you, where did you exhibit this piece? This is, this has traveled quite a bit. This piece has traveled quite a bit and then pieces of it have found homes, um, but it, it's traveled quite a bit. It's been up in uh, Sacramento at the Crocker. It's been over um, at the Jewish Museum in, in Los Angeles. Uh, I think it's uh, the University of Judaism. And the, yeah, so it has been moving around a little bit. It's not commercially the best thing I ever did, but it certainly has been uh, something I have to do. Well, and I think this is a good, there are politics and current affairs definitely show up in most of your work. So sometimes, oh, this yes, is, even yeah. when you, when you, because you kind of have this, there's this beautiful ornateness that kind of draws you in. But then once you start really thinking about what you're seeing, the power of the message starts to come through. Yes, indeed. The only thing I would point out is these are all little tokens as if of relocation. But if you look at the birds on the right hand side, they are swimming at peace. During World War II, Japanese Americans uh, in, in the relocation camps wore um, birds in flight and they've turned them into pins uh, to symbolize the wish for freedom and flight. So right now, my cultural baggage is that we're at peace and, and the birds are swimming calmly. Japanese lacquerware, particularly from the Edo period, uh, and particularly within that, the Momoyama uh, movement of uh, black, uh, gold lacquerware, I just think is the best in the world. And so I try to emulate that quite a bit. Yeah, and you can see that. This was my senior show at Otis. I, I always like to show this because um, this is, it really illustrates the, uh, the beginning of um, using color theory that I, that I was taught using analogous color uh, schemes. Uh, we, I was always told to repeat the form, repeat the shape. And if you don't, you better have a damn good reason. And so I thought, well, I'm just gonna do a spoof on everybody at Otis who taught me everything that I'm not only gonna make the teapot and the cup, I'm gonna have the teapots carved and the cups running around uh, and, and actually include it in the knob. That's great. And also, I mean, Okay, because you, I helped work with you and Joe on the beginning yeah. of the Ralph Becerra exhibition. So do you want to talk just a little bit about Ralph and kind of his influence on you? Well, I would, I love talking about Ralph. Ralph, you know, Ralph had a, uh, never kept any secrets from any of his students and all of these techniques that you see right here uh, were techniques that Ralph taught me uh, how to use gold handle, gold luster, uh, underglazing, overglaze enamel, um, multiple firings, form follow, uh, surface follows form, uh, using color theory, uh, and multiple firings. Yeah, that's wonderful. And just to say that um, the Ralph Becerra exhibition at Otis College of Art and Design. If you Google it, there's some fabulous material, and there was a beautiful book done too. So if you want to learn more about Ralph, who's a very important LA ceramicist, you can find that information out there. So here's teapots and tea bags. <laughs> this one uh, just came from uh, stacking a bunch of uh, dishes in the sink and looking and, and trying to see, you know, how we do that. But I was also thinking of a woman's role at the time, you know, uh, with feminism, early feminism, a woman's role in, in the kitchen, in, in cooking. And then in the center, I thought, well, this is very interesting because this is, um, I modeled that, I made about four tea bags about the women in Sex in the City. So that's, this is kind of timing it. And uh, that gives you a sense of time. And then the other was stacking on the right-hand side and the left-hand side, I'm stacking uh, life-size teapots and cups. Uh, the one on the left though was lost in the World Trade Center. It was in the Morgan Stanley collection. So ironically, the teapots and cups are um, tumbling. Yes. How did you decide, or was there a decision about 
making functional work or making sculpture or for you? You know, I, I don't think I ever had a aha moment on that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, Ralph was such a good teacher and I spent three years uh, with so many assignments from him that it took me the first 10 years just to try to work through it. You know, mm -hmm. I would, because we had so many assignments and then we moved and we had another assignment, we moved and he never really let us stop. It was, but basically his thought was that we had to be technically very skilled in everything so that we had the, we had the uh, freedom to make anything we wanted. And so for the first 10 years, I think I was repeating some of the assignments to tell you. Mm -hmm. So we had to throw well, cast well in plaster, hand build well. We had to fire at all temperatures, high, medium, and low, low, low temperatures. And so I would play in that direction. Awesome. All directions. Same, the same series. Same more teapots, yeah. Tea, tea sets, yes, yeah, sorry. Tea towers. And then I joined the product design department at Otis. So I thought, okay, I got to do function, you know, walk the way I talk. So I started to make plates and then I thought, okay, well then I'll have make precarious plates. And then I thought, well, I better then tile the um, backsplash. And then I, oh, I better, you know, I better have bamboo cabinets, bamboo tile and a bamboo floor, bamboo, bamboo, bamboo. <laughs> I talk to the students a lot about staging your work. And so this is one of those staging assignments. So with this, with this platter, mm -hmm. um, what, what was the process with this or your, well, it, it's a leaf, you know, and mm -hmm. I, think, yeah. Uh, yeah. And my thought was that the first plate was probably a leaf. You know, if, if you think about it. And then uh, the process is a huge, is a big hump mold a big plaster hump mold where I drape a big slab on it and then carve it and then release it. So that's how I can get these unusual shapes sometimes. You know, the, the, the straightforward thing would be just to cut a circle over a hump, but this, but why bother? Mm -hmm. Also, I tried to play with black. Yeah, these yep. are casted. I, I, may, I, I threw the, uh, through the top parts of the chalices, and then I carved them, I casted them. As you can see, there's a lot of veining and sprigging. I thought, oh, they're gonna blow off. So I, I casted them and then I extruded the stems and then I threw the feet and I said, well, I get tired of throwing the feet. So I cast the feet too. So this is an attempt towards, because I'm in the product design department, this was my attempt towards function. So were all of these that we're seeing made at the same time or was there a progression? All of it's been done. Developing, okay. And the reason is that I, I, I have to fill the kiln. So, you know, you have a plate and then you've got, a, you know, a tea tower and then there's a corner and I can place cups and saucers and I can also place um, uh, glassware or this, this, these chalices. And I, ha I was working with the American Hand in Washington, D.C., um, Dorothy Weiss in San Francisco, Garth Clark in Los Angeles, Kansas City, and New York City, and Sybaris in, in Michigan for a short while. Oh, and Farron Gallery in Northampton. So I, they had all different types of things they needed. Mm -hmm. the That's quite a few galleries to keep. Yeah, it was, I was very yeah. fortunate. The Otis uh, student sales were robust and I had many invitations. I was very lucky. And this, I should say that this is real gold. So my, uh, I, I am melting the gold onto the surface of the piece. Wow. And this is hanging over your dining room table. <laughs> this is another attempt towards function. Uh, and it is really when I, it, th I'm, this goes back to 1992. Uh, my, uh, we had just had the big fire. We were, no, 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 no. Uh, the 93, we had the big fire. So this would, might be 92 where I started worrying about the coral reefs in Hawaii. We were on vacation. And so I, I made the centerpiece, which is a coral reef, but I made the pools black uh, because I was concerned that they were looking damaged. We would go to Hawaii, Big Island, Hawaii. We'd go to Kauai. We'd go to, we Lanai is our favorite. And we used to, and I was just noticing the coral was changing. And so I thought, well, I don't know why, 
but I'm going to do I'm going to do something about the coral. And then these are bento boxes. So on the raised gold areas, I, you can put fish or chicken, or, and in the recessed areas, sauces and dipping sauce or rice. And in the center, of course, sushi. And then it's a service for six. And my former dining room table is mounted to the wall. We, I knocked off the legs and bolted the former dining room table to the wall. So now it's just a wall sculpture. I guess, but it is storage because when you do something this big, where do you store it? And when you use it, how do you wash it? And it didn't fit in the kitchen <laughs> sink. And so I have to wash it with the hose. So function is still challenging. Yes. <laughs> it's very hard. <laughs> Function is extremely hard. All of this is uh, uh, ocean ecology, concerns about the ocean, inspired by the ocean. Uh, on your left-hand corner uh, is my uncle George's uh, funeral urn. This one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. And you can see in the center bottom row is a uh, a sea urchin teapot, and of course the coral teapots. So how do you get the coral surface built up? <laughs> I mean, you've got so many textures and colors and then... Okay, the secret is I use pencils. Oh, okay. I just poke them. Oh, and Dull then... pencils, sharp pencils, sharp pencils, pencils with deep, yeah, it's just very simple, pencils. Wow. Uh, the and, and then how how are you firing? Do, can you do this in one fire or how does no, this? Oh, no, no, no. Okay, so uh, can this, you explain this, the process a little bit? <laughs> so first there's a bisque firing where we fire out the chemical and physical wire water. And then comes the glaze firing, which I fire to 06, which is a low temperature. And I get the, I get the background color down. And then after that, I go back in and China paint and gold luster at 019. And every time I layer a color in China paint or gold, I have that that's a firing. I cannot put one color on top of another color, one color at a time. So I fire high and I progressively lower my temperatures so that I don't wipe out what I done what I had done previously. So so you found your way to ceramics. Is it because there are so many different skill sets that you need that it keeps you just really challenged i mean because you're dealing with the science you're dealing with painting you're dealing with you know gold leafing your i mean everything so yeah i guess you know you have a really active mind so is this just like is this your puzzle your perpetual puzzle this is my problem yes <laughs> my problem because Meg's been over to the house I'm experimenting with plants in the front growing vegetables and fruits in the front yard and uh, caused the city to cite me for removing the lawn in 2006 now they're paying us $500 to, re to remove our lawns but I, I removed we removed it in 2006 and the whole house is a great big experiment as is ceramics yeah and I do change a lot. Well, oh yeah, this was food as metaphor. Um, so sushi became the new fast food. I, I remember when uh, nobody knew what sushi was, but then I thought, wow, on the left-hand side is California's role in the economy and maybe the subprime lending and uh, the tamago or the uh, egg sushi has a fly on it. And it also says tarp which is the, you know, the TARP program. So it's a kind of a wrapping of, of our economy. Our dependence on fossil fuels um, are our serious problem. And over on your right is the, is the, the platter is of course uh, the United States of America in black and with the same commentary with uh, fish diving into the sushi with overfishing. Um, snails crawling around creepy and awful um dollar bills being uh as part of the wasabi uh, the mustard and kind of has a spiciness to it oh the flies i see flies <laughs> yeah uh, i use plastic flies yes so and beauty is very important to me but then i put the flies in because i like to hold the beauty in check Many people come to me, including a gallery owner of great renown said, 
could you just hold back on the flies? And I said, why, why? Because there's something kind of creepy about this whole thing. And think about it, one fly can ruin your whole meal. Well, we've got a lot of reasons to ruin our whole meal in thinking. Also, the California has the California Gold Coast, where of course it's very high real estate. So there was an exhibition that I had worked on um, when I was running the Contemporary Arts Forum in Santa Barbara, and it was called Diabolical Beauty. And I know I kind of referenced this earlier, but it's this idea you have this beautiful plate of food, uh, but then, and it's, and it's made beautifully and these lavish um, surfaces, but then when you get up close, you start to see what the real message is and that, so you're kind of putting these harsh messages out there, but you're very, you know, you're luring people into looking at it and exploring it. And you do that really well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Miso Deflated. This is subprime real estate crash. And uh, I have my head, uh, I, I silk screen my head on a, a million dollar bill. So I can <laughs> sit there, there's my face. And uh, of course, that's the, that's the roof of, of my garage, actually, where my studio is. And I made a Miso Shido bowl. And of course, the, um, the real estate uh, uh, collapse of... Uh, 2008, 2009. And a rickety, you know, fence. People weren't able to maintain their homes. Uh, lots of foreclosures. It was a very dark period. Yes. This is the Tipping Point Cup Series. Um, this came out at the worst time and uh, people were really frightened uh, and very uneasy about the economic collapse. This came out in 2009. My timing couldn't have been worse for sales, but I was making a comment uh, from uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, Tipping Point. And here you have, again, our dependence on fossil fuels, overfishing and subprime lending. Oh, President Trump. <laughs> this is called Trump trash and the snail is pooping dollar bills. This is a series that I call, um, I, I sign on the bottom made in Pasadena. <laughs> so is that, a, is that a plate you made or is that a found plate with this all the is, flowers? This is a um, bisque plate that I bought. And then I took um, old fashioned, uh, ceramic decals and fired them down and then I stuck bugs on them so I found bumblebees and I got I've got some cockroaches kind of integrated on these plates oftentimes it's fantastic Oops. and pooping dollar bills oh, <laughs> let them eat Trump I was trying to I thought I would build the White House and I said oh no 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 I'm just going to have all those people eat Trump <laughs> in the form of snails Right. So is that like a piece of cake? Yes. Yeah. It's a white cake. And it's a it's a it's a covered container. My nod at function. <laughs> so you can store things inside. Oh yes. It's okay. quite you know, it's quite large. It's probably in diameter, about uh, seven inches in diameter. You can store some something in there, sure. Oh, Washington is usual, lots of creepy crawlers. Um, something's missing in the cake. Slimy people. And you're using the snail because things move so slowly in politics? Yes, they do. They really do. Uh, Overconsumption and decadence. You know, one full... Uh, this is this. I was not making covered containers at this point. On the left, I was just trying to get the frosting right and trying to figure out. This is also part of Made in Pasadena. And on your left, I, I'm finally thinking, oh, I can make a covered container out of this. And I have, I have uh, creepy crawlers emerging out of the frosting and out of the cake. Attempts at function. Yeah, this is on the left is Jap uh, is called Asian kitsch, you know, I so I took every stereotype that I could think of, you know, the cherry blossom, and then I had to stick cicadas and beetles and the um, the caterpillar is actually the spout of a teapot. So it's actually a teapot spout. And the lid comes off, it says, uh, these are moon cakes. And the same on your right. 
but I have a fly in there too. A few flies. Yeah, sometimes I have the flies belly up too. They, they ate too much and they died. So are those flies plastic too, or did you make yeah, them? Those are plastic flies. Okay. Actually, I'm having, I have a shortage of plastic flies now. I can't find these, the flies I like. So They're maybe probably the stuck on a shipping container somewhere. <laughs> oh, but I have black widows. I'm working with black widows now. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And you did the same treatment on the plate? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Ceramic decals. This is uh, the beginning of uh, the of the COVID cupcakes. So I've been cr uh, making a, a chronological study of of this whole period. So the, the very first COVID cupcake, I said, search for a cure is on your left. And then in the center top center is a uh, search for a vaccine. On your right is stay at home economy. On your left is hope for the flowers. But I do have a black widow kind of nestled hiding under the flowers. Uh, here you, you can see another, ver you can see the version of um, stay at home cupcake where I have a ballpoint pen syringe and then a covered jar and it opens into a container. So it's also a pen holder, a not at function. And here um, was the, on the left hand, right hand side bottom was, um, America's great reopening. That was our first attempt at reopening our economy. Today I'm working on a COVID cupcake cemetery, I was telling um, Meg, because we have, and the tombstones say no vaccination, no mask. Uh, no yeah. Care. You said you were reading a really interesting book right now. Yes, I'm reading uh, Scott Gottlieb's uh, Uncontrollable Spread. It just came out. I think I pre-ordered it. I'm listening it to books on tape, but I'm going to get the hard copy because it's written like one of the best fiction stories I've ever seen. In fact, it's shocking. It, it is so well written. And he was the former FDA commissioner uh, and, and resigned a one year before uh, COVID, but he had great knowledge of the organizational uh, systems of our public health system and very insightful. I mean, he's really, he was appointed by President Trump uh, as FDA commissioner or commissioner of the FDA. And, uh, and, but he, and he is, he is critical of President Trump. However, he's very critical of our public health system and the CDC and the FDA and Congress and, and the, and how we were ill prepared for this pandemic. And very early on, he called it uh, as a, pro, you know, a, a serious, problem in the future, and it happened. Uh, Kokeshi um, are the wooden dolls that you see here. Uh, uh, many of them are very hard to collect nowadays because of the um, Fukushima uh, disaster. Most of the Kokeshi were, um, are carved and made in that area uh, and Northern Japan as well, Sendai. So we collect these a little bit and they've influenced a whole lot of work. This one was, uh, this one I made right after 9-11 and it's uh, for the Japan Foundation where the Japanese who perished in, in the World Trade Center, the families could put a little uh, memory or a little note to their, uh, to their uh, deceased relatives on 9-11 and it's been placed inside this urn. On your left is Sustained Beauty, which is, um, where I start to begin to really start being able to get uh, large work, I received a, a grant from the Center of Cultural Innovation, which allowed me to have a big kiln so I could make bigger work. And so I, uh, but not necessarily, mo uh, my mechanics are kind of weird. Um, I went to Home Depot, there's a paver, concrete paver. I used plumbing flange and I nailed it. I screwed it into the into the concrete. And then I have a plumbing pipe that acts as the armature that links all of these pieces together. What, what year are these? Uh, I would say about, let's see, maybe about 2010, mm -hmm. 2000 to 12. So I start stacking and I'm thinking of the Kokeshi. I'm thinking of mm -hmm. the, the wooden dolls and abstracting hu hu uh, human figures. This is a recent show. This was just up in the windows of Craft in America Center. Uh, these are bleached coral totems. 
And I said to Emily uh, Zayden over there, I said, look, let's try putting these um, solar reflectors in the, in the front because it is a sunny window and we got enough of a charge so that we could, I could use Christmas tree lights, LED Christmas tree lights using solar, solar panels. And we were able to light the, uh, light the, uh, light, light it up. I was very pleased. Which, and you've been refining, refining that process. Yes, and this is a new piece that just went up in LAX Southwest Terminal with Craft in America, and you can see my chandelier uh, suspended with aircraft cable. Which we'll see more of in a minute. Themes and Projects Gallery took a big risk and uh, gave me a one-person show called Global Warming. And here's a totem, and then this one uh, lights up too with solar lights. And how big is this, Joan? It's about, uh, with the pedestal, about four and a half feet. So I can, I can increase size and also I can ship UPS or FedEx because these pieces <laughs> are modules. I mean, sometimes this is really important. Yeah, you really have to think, think it all the way through. Mm -hmm. The size of the kiln, UPS dictate a lot of things. This one's called crying <laughs> coral. I would really like to adapt these to indoor or outdoor um, because I think we could do this. We, we don't have to have these ugly um, outdoor lighting systems that we have. I think it, clay can go as outdoor sculpture very easily. That'd be beautiful. Yeah, I think it could work. And this is the same chandelier that's hanging in LAX? Yes, yes. So it's a similar chandelier. This one is um, put together with Costco puck lights. I saw these Costco puck lights that you put inside your closets. I said, ah, 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 this is great because I was at the, I knew I was doing a show at the American Museum of Ceramic Art and there's the vault and I was in the vault, which it used to be an old bank building that's been adopted and I can't get any solar lights. So I thought, ah, 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 ah. so I put the puck lights inside and then with a remote, they can be turned on and off and that's using aircraft, awesome. spending with aircraft cable. Well, then it's also easy to replace if you become the proud owner of one of these places, of one of these pieces, then you can replace the lights easily. Very easily, yes, yes, same idea. And, and of course I'm punching a hole through to kind of reveal sort of a haunting human um, crime that we have caused with the bleaching of the coral reefs. When I first started this bleaching of coral reef period, this was in 2006, one of my students came in with bleach coral from her home in Guam. And mm -hmm. Valerie Wu came in and she said, Joan, you got to look at this. And I, I said, what is this? And she goes, this is the coral. It's just washing up in fragments and covering our beaches. And I, and I carried that coral in my chunks of coral in my purse and in my wallet. And I mean, everywhere I, I carried it, looked at it and thought, okay, I got to start do, working in this direction. So from about 2006 to 2008, I was having a uh, a crisis because I've never done anything just in white mm -hmm. because color has been so important but this was an important story to tell and it was important to try to warn people of bleach coral and people really didn't understand what I was talking about then now I think it's pretty common knowledge and you can see these two um, using the Costco puck lights that with batteries <laughs> and I recharge the batteries too uh, this is uh, this is going to Lamps Plus, and I bought the hardware and all the wiring and made cer uh, ceramic um, sconces for a home in uh, Beverly Hills. Oh, fantastic! I don't have to. I don't want to do the lighting. You know, I want somebody else to figure out the lighting and get all the licensing to make it safe. So all I do is take off the uh, ornamentals and place my my ornamentals. Uh, so you said this was a commission? Yes. And this is oh, your this garden. is the infamous front yard on the top. My husband is an organic, uh, retired organic produce broker, and we said, "That's it. Let's take out the front lawn." And the city of Pasadena had conniptions for doing this. And you can see that we can grow our um, our garden in the front yard, and the neighbors come and pick whatever they want, um, along with everyone else. Could be bears, deer, and everyone else. So I've kind of and you know I've kind of uh, created a critter buffet out in the front yard. and the backyard, our tree had to be removed. So I decided to build a tree and it was very hard. 
to get people to do this with me? So these are the things that we're missing by not being at being able to go to your studio. But from what I've been told is if we had pulled up in a bus, Joan would meet us right in front of the garden and lead us through the garden into the back where her um, where she has a fabulous patio that has her lamps everywhere and we would see her kiln and what she's working on and what's on the table right now. So. And that's another picture of her yard. So does anyone have any questions? I know we only have a couple minutes, um, but Joan, I wanted to thank you for running oh, us through all of your work and letting pleasure. us see your, where you live and what you're growing and all of those good things. <laughs> I, we have no questions. So I think we covered it all. I hope everyone can come, you know, once we get uh, safe and stuff, let's say, you know, you're all welcome to come and visit. Oh, we had a question come in. Do you make work every day? Oh, I try to. Um, when I'm teaching, it's, it's, you know, I teach to three to six hours, you know, uh, three days a week. So while I'm teaching, one way I do get away with it is my assignments are often related to something rolling in, around in my head. So um, right now the students are working, I have a, I teach a science class called Avoiding Climate Disaster and it's about climate change. And so uh, the students are doing the same sort of ideas that, and I'm hearing their ideas and I'm hearing new information and they're doing research that is related to what I'm, I'm interested in. For example, here I'm running um, LED lights that are, um, that should, I should not have to replace for probably 45 years, which is very optimistic thinking on my part, but I use an aircraft cable to suspend the ceramic lamps. And then I, I dangle the LED light down the center so that I don't put any pressure on the uh, electricity because that's the last thing I wanna do. And then in the center, I have the drainage. So I, I, I had the whole backyard regraded because every time we had a flash flood, it would flood our house. So I had the whole backyard graded and the center island is the largest drain you can ever imagine. So when it gets flooded back here, it sounds like a flushing toilet. I didn't quite get, I didn't quite know that was gonna work. And then when I, uh, there's a huge pipe that goes to the left that goes to the street. And so then I built, a, I put a Costco shed right on top of it thinking that I would get the water inside the shed and have tanks inside so that I would pump all the water would rush into my Costco shed and then I would have these tanks of water that I could then water my garden when it wasn't raining. However, I'm off by about six inches and so now that's a total failure and the water doesn't go into the shed. It, st it still wants to go to the street. So now I have to then dig up the front yard a little bit. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna bury tanks in and before it goes to the street, it's going into my water receptacles in the front yard. I'm gonna bury them and put a, a palm tree on top or something. That's amazing. Um... Yeah, we're getting some nice comments. So someone says, as a teaching artist, I've been very inspired. Thank you so much. On the separate note, I hope Costco gives you a discount. <laughs> and then, uh, have you been to Manzanar? And oh, if so, yeah. how has it affected your work? Manzanar was, um, I saw Manzanar for the first time in 1974. Uh, and there was no, it was not a national park at the time or anything. We just we wandered there, um, my boyfriend, now husband, and I just wandered over there and it was just abandoned. It was truly a, a ghost town. And there were, uh, I just walked around and every time we went up to Mammoth or you know to Crowley Lake or whatever, uh, and also later on in Bridgeport where Amy ha uh, knows Bridgeport, um, we would uh, go to Manzanar. So yes, that's a good question. Uh, Manzanar has been very important in my thinking and, and it is what I wrote my um, paper, my senior thesis was on, um, oh gosh, little, the history of Little Tokyo during World War II uh, and what happened to Little Tokyo. Uh, uh, and it became the celebrated Bronzeville, an African-American community. So my, 
my efforts to study Japanese American history actually turned into telling the story of African American migration during World War II. Interesting. But, yeah, but I started at Manzanar. That's a good question. And the the people of uh, uh, Jeannie and Jim Houston, uh, who wrote Farewell to Manzanar, were good friends of mine, and they would come to Crossroads School and speak, and they came to Otis to speak as well. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, yeah. John, I want to thank you. You're, you know, I intentionally wanted you to be our first artist because you actually live and breathe art and creativity and inspiration every day. I mean, it shows up in everything you do and from your teaching um, to just the way you organize your house and your garden and all the things you believe in are just so evident in everything that you make and do. So thank you for sharing with us in the Brentwood Art Center. And we hope um, our audience will return for the next one with DJ Hall, which is on October 18th. And we hope you'll, you know, tell your friends about this if you enjoyed it. And if you have any other questions or anything, please feel free to reach out to the, um, to Amy um, or me. And I guess that's it. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. <laughs>